So if you will turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, we are going to uh, complete Romans 8 tonight. And so we're going to jump right in. Romans 8, really Romans 1 through 8, has been an amazing journey thus far. We've been in half of this book for um, about a year. And um, it's an important part for us to get. And so uh, some of us were talking before we got started about our Apostle Paul and, and how, you know, Paul wasn't always Paul. Paul used to be a persecutor of the church. And, and according to sin, he would consider himself chief. But when, when Paul was converted, he was wholeheartedly converted by our Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happened, he wholeheartedly gave himself to the dispensation of the grace of God. He took his apostleship very seriously. And as much as we want so much of our family members and our friends to get it, to understand the gospel and to believe it, Paul wanted that even more so. The things that he suffered, the things that he went through so that we could have the written word of God. And he did this thing willingly. And so we're grateful for that, grateful to be here tonight. We're going to cover verses 36 through 39 tonight. So if you'll turn there with me, I'm going to read Romans 8, 36 through 39 in its context, and then we'll begin to break it down. Romans 8, 36, as it is written, for thy sake, we are counted, I mean, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, that verse 36 comes after a question Verse 35 poses question, two questions. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And I do want to point that out real quickly before we get started. There are seven things named in verse 35 that Satan uses to try to move us from the mark of, of, of where we are, move our affection, so to speak. He uses tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword. So those are all those seven areas, those seven tactics that Satan is going to use. And then Paul goes right into the next verse, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. So Satan tac Satan's tactics are not new. That persecution, uh, and we went over each one of those last week, persecution, I mean, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword. Those are not new things. Psalm 44, 22 says that for God's sake are we killed all the day long. Now, we know that Psalms is referring to saved Israel going through the tribulation period. But here, the Holy Ghost, through the pen of our Apostle Paul, I want you to remember that whenever something is pulled in, to Paul's epistles from the Old Testament or from a scripture that is actually given to Israel, when the Holy Ghost pulls it into the New Testament or to, not the New Testament, to the epistles of Paul, uh, that that is to us, he is now applying that scripture also to us. So Psalm is referring to saved Israel going through the tribulation, but because the Holy Ghost through the pen of the Apostle Paul, applies it to us today uh, in the dispensation of grace as well by bringing it into Paul's epistles. So that scripture again, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. When your focus is on the things of God, it is not on the things of this world. Colossians 3, 2 tells us to set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. That affection is our love. That's our attention. If you love something, you pay attention to it. If you love someone, you're all about making them happy. 
Well, in this case, when we love God, he says, set your affection on things above, brings it out of this realm, this physical earthly realm, and set it on things above, not on things on the earth. So when, when your focus is on the things of God, it's not on the things of this world. And since all unbelievers, and unfortunately, most believers focus on the things of this world, it's hard not, I'm going to say this right here. It's hard for us not to focus on things of this world, especially if we're in the position of say, raising our children, you raise your children, you're focused on things that are happening around them. Because as mamas, your focus is on protecting them from what they might see and what they might hear and what they might do. So your focus in a sense has to be on those things. So we understand that, but spiritually speaking, our focus needs to be on where our hope is, and that is in, in heaven. But here, unbelievers and most believers focus on the things of this world. Their perspective is much different from the believer who is allowing Christ to live in him. The former, we're on page 152 if you're in Eric's book, the former is focused on getting a good paying job. If you're focused on the world, that's what you're focused on. We need a good paying job. Some people want to be very wealthy. We want to have a good family. We want to enjoy the things of the flesh. And Eric posts here or puts here that it is when our flesh, we want to enjoy the things of the flesh, that there's nothing good, Paul tells us in Romans 7, 18, in our flesh. So when we want to focus on the things of the flesh, then we're probably kind of giving into the lust of the flesh in some capacity. The latter is focused on what he has in Christ. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood here. I don't want you to think that it's wrong for you to want a nice home. I'm looking around at all of the people who have their, their cameras on and I can see you're living, you have a roof over your head. You don't look like you're um, freezing or you're out in the rain or you're anything like that. So those things, I'm not saying that we should not or that we it's wrong for us to want those things. That's that's not what I'm saying. But we want to focus more on what we have in Christ and not only what we have, but who we are in him. Ephesians 1, 3 says that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So if I am, am focused only on this earth, I don't realize those spiritual blessings that I have in heavenly places. He says here, since all unbelievers are dead spiritually, they cannot understand the things of God. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 14. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. I want to share that in brief um, because we need to remember that. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. My page is kind of, they're getting thin in my Bible, so they're hard to turn. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says this. I thank God, no, wrong, wrong chapter, <laughs> 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So the natural man, the unbeliever cannot understand the spiritual blessings he has in Christ because he's not in Christ. He has no capacity to understand that. But we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16 tells us. And the world, as we learned in Romans 1, has reprobate minds. Because of this, the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, um, it means a whole lot more to us. The way Eric puts it here, because of this and the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, unbelievers attacks on us um, are all on the flesh level. And sometimes we are going to have persecution. The word of God tells us that all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That persecution can come from an unbeliever, but it can also come from a believer. We are all going to have that um, but we need to understand that is part of the tactic of Satan and Satan can, he can't touch your spirit. He cannot, you're, you're, ye are dead and your life is now hidden with Christ in God, but he can touch your flesh. 
So that's what he does. He uses the tactics mentioned in verse 35, tribulation, distress, persecution, uh, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword in order to do that all for one purpose, to keep you from letting Christ live in you, to keep your focus on things of the earth. So since we are concerned as believers with spiritual things, we need to be focused on that spiritual level. We do not defend the removal of those fleshly things. Therefore, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. So that's what Paul means when he says that. As a believer, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. In other words, Satan's forces, including all people who are children of the devil, think that we are, as Eric says, nincompoops. Has it been a long time since you heard that word? been a long time since I heard that word, but they think that you and I are nincompoops because they can't understand where we're coming from. They can't understand our, our, our belief. And because they are evil and we are not trying to stop them, they will do everything they can against us. That is why the rest of that scripture says we are killed all the day long. But we are reminded here in this commentary, but that's okay because of what we mentioned earlier, Colossians 3, 3, because I am dead, spiritually speaking, my I am dead and my life is hid with Christ in God. Spiritually speaking, I'm alive. I, I, I said that wrong. My I am dead, flesh. I am dead to the flesh. I am dead to the sin nature within me. Doesn't mean that I don't acknowledge it sometimes and it doesn't rear its ugly head because it certainly does for all of us. And we'll get more into that a little bit later. But they keep killing our flesh over and over and over. Where What's in our flesh? Our feelings. Our feelings are in our flesh. And I just got to be honest with you. I got my feelings hurt today from someone I love that is kind of along this line, that somebody I love, it's a fellow believer, but Satan will even use that to hurt you where you'll feel it. Your spirit is, is alive in Christ, but your flesh is still going to feel the tribulation. It's still going to feel the persecution. It's still going to feel the distress. The word distress we talked last week about the a portion of that word is stress. You feel that. So that's a tactic that Satan uses. Meanwhile, Christ is strong through us, living abundantly. And that's where we have to remember where our blessings are. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So our strength is there. What does the word of God tell us? that when I am weak, then am I, meaning he is strong. And there is nothing, nothing anybody can do to stop that. The strength of Christ in you. Nobody can stop it. Nobody can come against it. Nobody can take it away from you. That's another reason we live in the most in incredible time, the dispensation of the grace of God. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else or any time else than now, even though it's heartbreaking what we see happen in our world today. So that brings us to verse 37. So verse 35 said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sakes, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Why? Because all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer those things. That's why. But verse 37, it says, nay, in all of these things, all of what things? All of the things he just mentioned in verse 35, in all of these things, and in verse 36, all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And let me tell you, there's going to be times in your life where you have to remind yourself of that because that attack hurts. That attack will do what it is intended to do if you let it. And so you cannot let it. 
You have to remember who you are in Christ and who you are through Christ. Those are very important things. So that is why this verse says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We have conquered Satan's forces, stopping them from doing anything to us. But that's not all. On top of that, Christ is living in us, which means that God's kingdom is growing through us. Christ is living in us. So God's kingdom is growing through us. This makes us more than conquerors. Furthermore, God's kingdom will never stop growing. Isaiah 9, 7, and I referenced this scripture earlier today in our morning study, but I didn't have it written down. But tonight I thought, wow, well, here it is right here in tonight's lesson. Isaiah 9, 7 says regarding the Lord Jesus Christ, of the increase of his kingdom and peace, there shall be no end. So think about that. It's infinite. There will be no end of the increase of his government and his peace. So this speaks of the abundant life that we have been talking about. God did not save you for you to lounge around or get on your puffy cloud and eat cheesecake and bonbons all day. He didn't, you know, have the grapevines ready and set for you to just sit and eat grapes for all eternity. He saved you to work in Christ. Isaiah 9, 7, again, of the increase of his government. Think about that word government. Right now, we might not have a good opinion of government based on what we see in the United States of America. Our opinion of government is, is really not that impressive. But this speaks of the increase of his government, which tells you that there is a government uh, and peace, there shall be no end. So what are we saved for? Is to be a part of that governing body. Is to be a part of that. It's to work. Uh, in Christ, not to be confused with the works-based salvation. Uh, his kingdom will increase for all eternity because Christ will live in us. But we can get started on that now when we believe the sound doctrine found in Paul's epistles. So we need to note that this verse does not say that God delivers us from the sufferings that Satan sends our way. What he does say is that in all these things, we are more than conquerors. And what he also says here is who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Now, when we get to the last two scriptures, we're going to find that nothing will separate us. Nothing. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. We have to go through the suffering so that we can have God's will accomplished in us, which is for us to come into the knowledge of the truth. First and foremost, that every man be saved and then come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's the will of God for every man. So we need to note also that the way we are more than conquerors, it's not through Karen. It's not through Lisa. It's not through Paula. It's not through anybody else on here. It's through Christ, through him that loved us. That is how we are more than conquerors. This is in keeping with our identity being in Christ. Now, remember the first eight chapters of Romans, important sound doctrine for us, but it also begins to teach us who we are in Christ, that there is no condemnation to us. And we'll go over that again in just a few minutes. So our identity is no longer in who we are in the flesh but it is who we are spiritually speaking and we are in Christ. Our identity is through him and that's how we can be more than conquerors. Christ liveth in me. Galatians 2.20 reminds us of that to make me more than a conqueror. This keeps us from becoming prideful and gives the glory to God so that others may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. If I thought that it was all about me, and all about what I could do, what I could accomplish. Look at my accolades. You know, I, I used to work with a bunch of doctors. Doctors are important people, yes, that we need to respect. We need to respect their knowledge and, and all of that kind of thing. But doctors, some doctors, a lot of doctors, when they put those initials behind their name, it makes them 
kind of prideful. And when you work in, in the environment with them, I worked with one doctor who was very prideful and he had a terrible bedside manner because of that pride. He thought, you know, the people just should worship him because of what he was able to do for them. But for us, these things, these tribulations, these persecutions, these sufferings, they keep us from becoming prideful so that we can give the glory to God um, and, and that others might be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. That is probably one of the, the most important things that we could keep in check. It's our pride. I don't care how many initials you have behind your name, how many credentials, how many certifications, what you can do. It should never uh, make you puff up so much in your own pride to think that you don't need uh, Christ, that you don't need what God has done for us. So that brings us to basically the last two scriptures in this chapter, verses 38 and 39. And they are, I would say that in, in everything, and we'll go over that bullet point review in a second, but in everything that we've talked about in Romans 1 through 8 so far, it boils down to these two scriptures right here for us to understand who we are. For I am persuaded, I want you to think about that word, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is an all-encompassing list right there. And Paul says, for I am persuaded. He is absolutely convinced. Why is he convinced? Why should we be convinced? Because of everything we have read and studied from chapter one through eight, we should come to this conclusion also. We should be convinced, persuaded that neither any of those things will be able to separate us from the love of God, uh, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So Paul lists 10 things. And uh, he says that he's persuaded that these 10 things, um, nothing in that can separate us. He only has first experience with life and the things present, but he lists some things other than that. So it tells me that the Lord God has convinced him, has persuaded him, has made him believe that these things will not be able to separate him. The remaining things listed can only be known by someone in the spirit realm and that someone must be God or else Paul would have not would not have believed what was told to him. So the reason that Paul is persuaded about these things is because the Holy Ghost, you know how, how the Holy Ghost is our teacher? The Holy Ghost communicated these things to Paul's spirit as well. Um, by contrast, the reason that unbelievers and a lot of Christians are not persuaded that nothing can separate them from the love of, God, of Christ. I'm going to tell you, I was a Christian, I, I guess, I was raised in the church for the most part by, by my grandmother who made it her mission in life to make sure that we went to church, that we understood who God was. And we went to a church that had no problem convincing us, persuading us of our sin. We knew that we were definitely sinners and we knew that Jesus Christ was the son of God. We knew that he was buried and, and that he rose again the third day. We knew that. So I was probably a Christian from a, an early age, but from the time I filled or fulfilled the requirement of the church that I was going to, I was 17. So by that time, you can pretty much, I, I consider myself saved by that time because I believed the gospel. I didn't know right division. I didn't know any of that, but I believed the gospel, but I did not believe that nothing could separate me from the love of Christ. I believed that I had the power to do that. I had the power to separate myself because of my own performance, because of my own behavior. 
So I didn't know sound doctrine about who I was in Christ. And I would dare say to you that there are so many people out there that don't know that. They walk around in, in condemnation of self because they don't know that. But, but, and churchianity teaches that. They just do. I hate to say that, but they just do. So they're not, even believers sometimes are not convinced that nothing can separate them from the love of Christ. And it's because they don't understand Romans 1 through 8 doctrine. If they were persuaded, they would want to walk after the spirit so that Christ would live through them. So here um, at the bottom of page 153 and 154, Eric kind of breaks down these 10 things. Paul says, death cannot separate us from God's love. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57 lets us know that Christ defeated death on the cross. Christ became sin for you, sin for me on the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57 says this, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he says here, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, and he goes on into the, the death cannot separate us because we have been given victory over death. Uh, he says life cannot separate us from God's love. Galatians 2.20 reminds us that life, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life uh, which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So even life cannot separate me because ye are dead and your life is now hid with Christ in God. The life we now live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God. Angels, he says, neither life, neither death, nor life, nor angels. Angels cannot separate us from God's love because angels are ministering spirits. This is Hebrews 1.14. Tells us that angels are ministering spirits. Now I have written all of these scriptures down to remind myself that this is the word of God. Angels are ministering spirits for saved people. Hebrews 1.14 says, are they not all? Speaking of angels, ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. So even angels don't have the power to separate you from God's love. If they sin, God can put them in chains to keep them from hurting us. Now that's a, that's kind of an amazing, amazing thought. Second Peter 2, 4 says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So even angels don't have the power to separate you from the love of Christ. Principalities and powers cannot separate us from God's love because Christ triumphed uh, over the ones on Satan's side through the cross. Colossians 2, 14 and 15 say this, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So that's how principalities and powers cannot separate us from God's love. He talks about things present and things to come. These things cannot separate us from God's love because the things that are not of God are temporal. Second Corinthians 4, 18 says, while we look not uh, at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. That word temporal means they're temporary. They're not going to last forever. Um, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So the things present, the things to come cannot separate us from God's love because the things that are not of God are temporal. They're temporary since the Lord Jesus Christ will destroy all those things 
all those temporary things. Why does God want us to set our love, set our affection on things above? Because rather than things on the earth, because when we set our affection on things of the earth, we have a tendency not to want to let go of that. And the things on the earth represent our flesh life. Like I said, it doesn't mean that we won't desire things. We all have, you look behind me, I have a lot of things. I have a lot of things. We desire things. But my affection is not there. My affection is above. Because all of those things, they're just temporary. Just temporary. He says, height cannot separate us from God's love because no one is higher than God since he dwells on the sides of the north. Psalm 48, two, I want you to understand what this is. Psalm 48, I'm going to read verses one and two, uh, says this, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Verse two says, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. What does it mean when it talks about the sides of the north? It means the highest point, the highest point. Where did Lucifer say he was going to uh, to make his reign or whatever? On the sides of the north. He wanted to be in the highest place, but that's God's place. That's God's dominion. It's his domain. So height cannot separate us from God's love because no one is higher than that. No one is higher than God since he dwells in the highest place the sides of the north. Depth cannot separate us from God's love because his wisdom and knowledge are so deep that no one can find them. And not only that, but God created the deep. If you turn over a few pages in Romans to chapter 11, it says this, oh, the depth of the riches, both of, this is chapter 11, verse 33. Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. The depth of God goes deeper than anything. There, his ways are past finding out. So depth cannot separate us from God's love um, because his wisdom and knowledge are so deep that no one can find them. Any other creature cannot separate us from God's love because the Lord Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Therefore, no one can override his authority. When you believed the gospel and you were saved, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came to be an indwelling presence in your life. None of these things can separate you from that point. We can separate ourselves in the flesh, but in my spirit dwell is the on the in this flesh dwells the Holy Spirit. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. And nothing can. So Eric notes here, he put all of those scriptures in here to prove the point that nothing can separate us. That what Paul tells us here in verses 38 and 39 that he is persuaded of is the truth. For I am persuaded that neither height nor depth, nor uh, neither height, I'm sorry, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. He puts that in there and Eric gave us in this commentary, scripture references to back that up, to support that stance, that we can trust it, we can believe it, we can know it. And he says, this shows that God is the one who persuaded Paul that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, since God gave up his own son for us and gave us justification and glorification, no one can separate us from God's love. Now, back up in verse 35, we were told of the things, the tactics the adversary does to try to separate us from God's love. 
We touched on them when we first got started. Now in, in these last verses, we are told of spiritual powers. So verse 35 talks about tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword. Those are the, the, the things of the flesh, things that, that um, Satan uses now, his tactics now. But verses 38 and 39, we're told of the spiritual powers. So nothing in, nothing in the flesh that Satan uses, no tactic, and nothing that he uses in the spiritual realm can, can separate us from God's love. So, and, and those spiritual powers, such as Satan's devils, which will try to separate us from God's love, will all and do all fall short. Therefore, we should glory, Paul tells us, to glory in our sufferings because of what they produce in our life. They will produce an eternal weight of glory. Remember, the things of the earth are temporal. All these things, while they bring me joy, while they bring me pleasure, while they make me feel all warm and fuzzy in my cozy little home, um, they don't save me. They don't give me spiritual comfort, none of that, because they are all temporal. But the sufferings, remember Romans 8, verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's eternal glory. When I flip back to chapter 5, uh, verses 3 through 5, he says, Romans 5, 3 through 5, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. So it's not like we're going to go out there on the, on the street corner and start shouting glory for our sorrows in life, or our tribulations, our hard times. But spiritually speaking, we should glory in those things and allow them to have the work of God in our life. And in, like in, in chapter five, patience, they experience patience and hope. That's what those sufferings or those tribulations bring about in our life. So when we conclude here in this chapter, we need to remember that all of these things cannot affect us except what we allow them to affect us. All of these things cannot take away or come in between the love of Christ that, that we have or the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we can be confident. We can be persuaded that not only do our sufferings not take away our eternal life and our spiritual blessings, but they actually enhance them. They produce a, a, an eternal weight of glory in us. So how appropriate uh, that the last thing we are told in Romans 8 is that the love of God is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, because the entire chapter has been about us living in the spirit as a result of who we are in Christ. Therefore, since we are in Christ, and the love of God is in Christ. We cannot be separated from God's love. And you may have some friends who need to know that. I know I have some friends who need to know that because they come from the same background that I come from. They come from that place of not understanding who they are in Christ to realize that is nothing they can do to be separated from the love of, of God, which is in Christ, because they are in Christ. One of the scriptures I love, and I use it a lot, it's Philippians 1. Philippians 1 verse 6 says this, being confident. That word confident is kind of like that word persuaded. We can be convinced, convicted, absolutely sure, confident, being confident of this very thing, that he, which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So all of my thoughts, the whole time that I was locked into that theology 
thinking that I could be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, by my performance is not the truth. So as we close this chapter and, and we'll start chapter nine next week, I'm going to do a, a very brief bullet point review of where we started a year ago in Romans chapter one. First of all, if you take notes in your Bible, there's something I put in mind that I, I think is very, uh, well, it was important for me to put. I put when Romans was written, Romans was written around Acts 20, uh, verses one through three, somewhere in that place, uh, Acts 20 around verses one through three was, was about the time that, that Romans was written. So if you read Acts 20, you'll see where Paul was. You'll, you'll understand what was going on, uh, in for him when he actually pinned this epistle. And I also put there that it, it gives us, or it brings us the doctrine of faith. So when we read Romans, and when I start Romans, understanding what I'm going to be reading, it helps me. So if you printed it, your bullet point review off, you can follow along with me. I'm not going to go over the entirety of it. We don't have time to do that, but you do have it for your own, your own uh, references. First of all, Paul, it was important to Paul starting out Romans to identify himself and qualify himself for us. So in the very first verse, he his is his statement of qualification. He tells us who he is in the very beginning. He's called to be an apostle. He is separated into the gospel of God. And then right off the bat, verses three and four, another important thing for us to understand is who Christ is. And he establishes who Jesus is. He tells us in verse three that, that he is made of the seed of David according to the flesh which makes him fully man. But he is declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, which makes him then fully God. And for Jesus to be qualified as our kinsman redeemer, he had to be fully man because that's what we are. And to redeem us, he had to be fully God. So he had to be both fully man and fully God. And Paul lets us know that in the very beginning, Jesus Christ, fully man and fully God. Then he goes on down in verse 11. I want us to remember back when we did this, the first three and a half chapters of Romans were tough. And I used to say, I remember saying this, hold on, everybody just hold on because we're getting to the good part. We're going to get to Romans 3, 21, but now, which is where we live. And, but before we got there, sometimes it was a little tough and we had to stop in places that left us like, wow, you know, what is this? But we only spend an hour, an hour together. So we couldn't get it all in one sitting. But I kept saying, just hold on, just hold on. But here in verse, in chapter one, in verse 11, Paul lets them know, for I long to see you. Remember me telling you that he had this desire that they get it? just like our desire is for our family members and our friends and our loved ones to get it. Paul says in verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. I would suggest to you when you read the word of God that you read it as an inspired word, absolutely, but you read it with the emotion that comes with it that our apostle saying there, I long to see you. When you long to see someone, I went to California a few weeks ago. Why? Because I longed to see my son and my grandson and my daughter-in-law. I longed to see them. There was emotion attached to that. And remember that this is our apostle, Paul. He longs to see them to impart unto them some spiritual gift to the end. So this isn't a gift that is here today and, and gone when the word of God is completed. This is a gift that to the end has the ability to establish you. And he tells us in verse 16 what that was. Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, 
for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Paul is not ashamed of this gospel, this sound doctrine that he is bringing. He longs to see see them to impart this to them, this gospel. So by this, verse 16, we know that the, it is the gospel that holds the power of salvation. It's the gospel that is the key to everything. First Corinthians 15, one through four actually defines that gospel, but specifically verses three and four. Verses three and four, first Corinthians 15 say this, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So what is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ as atonement for our sins. Now for me to understand that or to believe that, I first, we talked about this this morning, have to recognize that I need that. And for me to recognize that I need that, I have to realize that I'm a sinner. That is the first step. Remember me talking about the doctor who has that credential behind his name and it and it kind of puffs him up in pride sometimes. I can't be puffed up when I look at myself and think that I'm not a sinner. I have to look at myself for the truth of who I am. And the truth of who I am apart from Christ is a sinner who is dead in my trespasses and sins. But when I believe that gospel, I am quickened because Christ quickens me. He makes me alive. So verse 17, there in chapter one, he says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now I have there in your notes that Eric's commentary says, talks about that faith to faith, refers to the two faiths necessary for salvation. So there's two faiths necessary for salvation. When you place your faith in Christ, who was faithful to go to the cross, you are saved. Thus, the righteousness of God comes upon man when man places his faith in Christ's faith. So you need your faith and you need Christ's faith. That's faith to faith. And when Galatians 2.20 talks about us living by the faith of the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us, it's talking about when I became saved, my faith was then exchanged for the faith of Christ. My faith brought me to him, but now I live. I have my being in his faith. So, and and then Habakkuk 2.4, where, where it says there that the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4 penned that the just shall live by his faith. And I love that. I love that it said that. Then verses 18 through 20, we learned that man is without excuse before God, not to glorify him as God, because God himself made manifest the things that may be known of him. So basically verses 18 through 20, it tells us that man is without excuse. But remember when we first started Romans, the first three and a half chapters was to show us that we are all under sin, both Jews both Gentiles and all the world apart from Christ. So in verse 21 and 30 through 32, these verses are important for us to, to understand the process of man and the process of God. So I have there on your printout uh, a section for man and a section for God. Man knew God, but he glorified him not as God. Verse 22, professing themselves wise, they became fools. They change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. There is a progression of man's sin here. They changed the truth of God into a lie. They worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Men and women left the natural use of one another and go, went against nature. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So based on that progression, what did God do? God gave them up to an uncleanness. He gave them up unto vile affections. And then finally, he gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now we talked about that. I can't remember exactly when it was in one of the, the Sunday lessons 
uh, with Eric, we talked about that progression. You give up, you give up until you just have had enough. And then finally you give over. We do that in our natural life. We try, we try, we try, we give up, we give up, we give up. And then I use the example, uh, we, we put together puzzles usually every year. We'll put together a big puzzle uh, and, you know, there's one puzzle that we never finished. We never finished it because the puzzle pieces were kind of oddly shaped and we tried over and over and over again. We took apart pieces, tried to fit other pieces in and nothing would ever complete that puzzle. So what did we do to it? We gave up on it. We gave it over back to the box. We never put it together again. So when we look at the progression of God here, based on man's sin, he gave them up unto uncleanness in verse 24. He gave them up unto vile affections, verse 26. And he gave them over to a reprobate mind. So when we recognize it is the gospel of Christ that has the power to save, and without it, we will stand guilty before God being without excuse. That's basically chapter one. And then as we went completely over to um, all of these, and I'm not going to go over all this, like I said, um, but I just wanted to kind of give us a, a, a brief overview and one that you could read on your own. But we learned in chapter two that the guilt, the Jews were guilty before God. Then in chapter three, we learned that the world was guilty before God. So, but we also in chapter three crossed over to this, but now, which is where we are today in the dispensation of grace, but now, and I wrote there, oh, the beauty of the, but now shift in this scripture, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So in that point, we crossed over. Then in chapter four, Abraham was saved by faith. We talked about, I believe in that chapter where there was a dual justification by Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith. And then he was also justified by faith plus works. Then in chapter five, a very important chapter for us, our identity in Christ. We learned the results of our justification by faith. Christ is the basis of our salvation. Justification by faith equals peace with God. So we learned that. We talked about the um, what the tribulation, the sufferings in our life bring. That's where Paul, we read it tonight, where Paul tells us to glory in our sufferings, glory in our tribulations, because they produce things in our life. So then, then we moved on to chapter 6. Chapter six, believers are dead to sin and slaves to righteousness. Understanding in Romans really five, six, seven, and eight, our eternal security. By Romans five, we are justified. And, and so that was an important concept for us to have in Romans as we moved on into Romans six. We are dead to sin. Doesn't mean that we don't have our sin nature. Doesn't mean that we don't sin. What it does mean is that Christ doesn't sin in us. Christ in us doesn't sin. And, and for me, we our, our sin nature does not keep us from that gift of eternal life in heaven. The wages of sin, the wages of that sin nature, Romans 6, 23 says, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Another thing, Saying it like that made me think of when you read the word sin, S-I-N in scripture, to understand that the singular word sin is speaking of your sin nature, the wages of sin, the wages of your sin nature, if you never believed the gospel, is death. But the gift of eternal, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we were moved from that place of earning the wage of death because of our sin nature to a place of eternal life. That there is no, no going back to that. Um, I think we're coming upon a time. 
in Romans where Paul is going to tell us that he could wish, or maybe we already covered that, he could wish himself be accursed for the sake of his brethren. But Paul can't say, let, let me lose my salvation so that they can have theirs. No, you can't do that. There's no, there's no going back. Once you're saved, you are saved. And that's what we learn in, ch in chapter six. We are no longer under the law, but we are under grace. And we need to remember, I put remember here, and this was Romans four, verse eight, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And we are blessed. That is uh, Romans four, eight. That is a scripture that, that Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brings in from David. So it applies to us as well. The Lord, when we have said yes to the gospel of Christ, yes, I believe, then that sin is not imputed to us anymore. That's amazing, even though we still live in this vile flesh. Chapter seven, we talked about, uh, Paul used the analogy of marriage. And he uses that analogy for a reason. The law was very clear where marriage was concerned and it was very well known. And this was an example that could be understood by his audience when he says, for I speak to them that know the law. He used that example because he was speaking to them that knew the law about marriage. That's why he uses that. And then the culmination of chapter seven, being verses 24 and 25, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? There again, Paul says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So if our apostle Paul can be delivered uh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, then who are we to think that we cannot be? We, we are and we can. And that brought us to Romans 8, which we've been in for quite some time. And that talked to us about life in the spirit. Um, one of the first scriptures, well, the first scripture, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There's understanding that we have to, to get there, that that doesn't mean that we can lose our salvation but it means that we are not under condemnation because we walk, uh, we are in Christ and we walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So that Romans 8 has been an important chapter. Um, I can remember when we got to Romans 8, 18, for, for I reckon, talked a lot about that word reckon, uh, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Very much like the word uh, that we have here in, in the latter part of the chapter, for I am persuaded. You know, Paul uses words. We talked about a word before we got started called beseech. Paul uses words that carry weight in what they mean. That word reckon carries weight in what it means. That word beseech, we haven't read it here, but that word beseech, you'll hear it, that Paul says it carries weight, carries meaning, depth. And this word here, persuaded, carries weight as well. So as we sum up verses 35 through 39, once again, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We are halfway through with the book of Romans. That is a, a we're going to see a slight shift here in scripture. And I wanted to give us a refreshment on where we are 
and how we got here. And when you go over this on your own and you go back through your book and your notes that you've taken, you'll you'll understand that more where we were, where we are, because we're fixing to go heading into a little bit a, a little bit more. We're going to see a little bit of, sh of a shift. Matter of fact, when I just said what Paul said, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. That's right there in Romans 9, verse 3. So we'll be getting there next week. So I hope that this hasn't been too cumbersome for you tonight. And that as we finished, you realize who you are in Christ. And you realize nothing, no tactic of Satan, no power or principality has the ability to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, as we close tonight, I thank you for your word. I thank you for just your infinite wisdom, Lord, that we have been able to share your word together for a long time, just here in Romans. And Father, that it has set us free from the bondage of the law, from the bondage of the world, from self-condemnation. Father, the gospel sets us free of our own pride. When we recognize that we are sinners, Father, and we trust in the cross work of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, Father, we are saved. We thank you, Father, for the power of that word, that your word carries power. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Father, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for Christ in us. And as we set forth to embrace Romans chapter 9 next week, Father, I pray that you would rest with each of us this week as we think on these things. Remind us, Father, daily of who we are in you and that we are secure eternally in you. And help us to, to understand what it means when your word tells us that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus or in heavenly places. Father, we thank you for so many things. And we just lift this prayer up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.